dedicated energizer facility um, in uh, uh, adjacent to uh, to downtown Bennington. And as part of that process, uh, this evening um, we're going to hear just kind of an overview of what the project uh, looks like, some basic market and uh, economic uh, data, uh, and then kind of where the project is headed from here from the team that's been working on it. So uh, welcome, uh, and then we will have an opportunity uh, to gather some uh, public input at the end. I have a couple of question prompts that um, would like people to uh, feel free to respond to as we get to that section of the meeting. Um, I would request a couple of reminders that people uh, stay muted um, if possible to avoid feedback um, when, uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, it would be really helpful given the number of people um, on the call, um, if you could use the raise hand function uh, at the appropriate time, it's gonna be hard for us to identify everybody um, on the screen when you'd like to provide some input. So if you don't mind using the raise hand if possible, uh, that would be great. And as you just heard, um, we are recording this uh, meeting. Um, just so we, we have that, uh, there has been a request from some folks to be able to view it uh, after the fact. So this meeting is being recorded. So um, with that, Callie, um, if you wouldn't mind um, setting up the uh, presentation, we'll uh, jump into the meeting. everyone seeing my screen okay? Yes, looks good. If you can move it into slideshow, that would be great. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Callie. So as I said, uh, the Energizer Reuse Plan public meeting um, is this evening. BCRC and um, was hired by the town of Bennington to undertake this study. Um, we have identified a steering committee to work um, as part of the uh, project with us. And the initial task of the steering committee, um, after getting kind of a briefing on uh, what this project entail and where it would be headed, um, was to put out an RFP for a consulting firm to assist with the project. Um, and through a competitive bid process, Camoin 310, um, which really works nationally, but it's based in Saratoga Springs, among other places, uh, was hired to assist in this project. And you will hear from Dan Stevens of uh, Camoin 310 um, coming up later this evening. Uh, so Callie, can you move to the agenda, please? Sorry, it doesn't look to be like it's working. Okay. Um, That's a bit of a nuisance. Oh, there we go. Perfect, thank you. So um, we're gonna begin this evening with a kind of brief project overview um, of, of kind of what this project will look like, what the reuse plan will and um, will not be, uh, frankly. Uh, we'll have some uh, market and demographic data for, by Jonathan Cooper from our office, as well as uh, Dan from Camoin 310. Uh, there is a current uh, housing and energizer reuse survey out. Uh, it is open through Friday. Uh, Callie uh, of our office will be providing an update of kind of the initial findings from that survey. Uh, and then we'll hear just a brief update from Vermont DEC uh, regarding uh, the environmental um, work that has been ongoing uh, actually for a number of years of, at the project and kind of where that stands. Um, that is not part of the work that we're doing, but will be brought into the final report uh, that work is being handled by uh, separate consultants. And then as I noted, we'll have an opportunity for uh, some public input um, into the project. Uh, Callie, next slide, please. So the components of the Energizer Reuse Plan um, will be a review and analysis of existing planning materials. The town of Bennington and its partners have undertaken kind of extensive, extensive planning work uh, over the years, including the town plan, a comprehensive economic development strategy that stretches um, across Southern Vermont in partnership with our um, colleagues in Wyndham County. Um, and very similar to this work um, in 2016, um, developed the Bennington downtown area-wide plan, uh, which in some respects um, was a bit of a catalyst for the Putnam Block Redevelopment Project. Looked at redevelopment opportunities, 
opportunities in downtown Bennington, um, brownfield sites, and really specifically focused on the four acre site um, that is known as the Putnam Block. And um, as we know, uh, we were fortunate to get um, a local group of investors to try to move that project forward. So that was a real example of how this type of planning work can, um, if you're fortunate and the stars align, lead to um, some very, um, very good outcomes. There'll be an existing conditions inventory and analysis, looking at the existing environmental condition, land use, maps, photos, just kind of basic background and overview of the uh, facilities and the surrounding site. There'll be a site analysis included, which will look at the infrastructure serving the site, uh, as well as any physical constraints uh, on development there. As we know, this is a nearly 300,000 square foot facility uh, in a residential area adjacent to downtown. So it presents some really unique um, challenges uh, and opportunities um, which make this project, as with most, um, a little bit unique. Uh, there will be a market study and you're gonna hear some early findings in that market study work from uh, Kamoin 310 and Dan Stevens. Uh, and I think important to note here, um, through some additional funding that was being uh, able to be brought into this project, uh, this market study will include an expanded town-wide housing assessment. So traditionally, when you do these types of facility reuse plans, you look at the opportunities for any given use at that facility. So this would typically look at what are the housing opportunities at the Energizer uh, facility hard stop. Given the amount of other development um, and potential development that is happening in Bennington, the aforementioned Putnam Block, uh, new owners at uh, the former Bennington Brush Building, new owners at the former Mount Anthony Middle School um, slash Ben High um, on Main Street, uh, some projects being undertaken by Shires Housing, the medical systems, new ownership of Southern Vermont College. There are a lot of potential balls in the air with regard to housing in Bennington. And we felt like this was a good time to kind of look at a broader perspective of housing needs and opportunities uh, in, uh, in Bennington. So that will be a part of this project uh, as well. There will be some basic um, redevelopment scenarios and just kind of uh, rough project feasibility analyses. Uh, and then that will all be um, brought into the development of the Energizer Reuse Plan and Implementation Document. Um, Given the funding for this, uh, which I should have noted up front, this project is being funded by two uh, state of Vermont sources, um, a grant from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and that has been combined with a municipal planning grant from the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, Shires Housing has also brought some money um, into the project to assist with that expanded housing uh, assessment work. So, um, being a state funding, which had uh, federal roots, um, there is a, a kind of hard stop of September 30th for this project to be completed. So we'll be looking to have this project um, completed uh, by um, middle of September to provide a little bit of, a little bit of leeway there um, for the project completion. Next slide, please, Cal. As I noted, there was a, uh, there is a steering committee that has been um, selected to assist with this uh, project. Really that steering committee, uh, again, initially um, was actively involved in the solicitation and um, selection of the consultant, uh, Kamoin 310. Um, and as we begin to move into the drafts of uh, these various components of the work, we'll be active in reviewing those and providing comment. Uh, you'll see the steering committee there um, listed from uh, Town of Bennington representatives, um, some um, community representatives from real estate development, uh, Chamber of Commerce, neighborhood representatives, um, housing representatives, um, real estate representatives. Um, you'll see VT Commercial, uh, John Beal and Eves Bradley. VT Commercial is the listing agent uh, for, on behalf of Energizer, working in conjunction with their national uh, real estate firm, JLL, but uh, VT Commercial. Uh, is the lead on uh, marketing the project. So they are at the table uh, on the steering committee um, as our um, uh, DEC um, folks uh, from the Department of Environmental Conservation 
And then the kind of staff components at, of Kamoin 310 and uh, the folks from our office at BCRC uh, that are working um, on this uh, project as well. Next slide, please. So with that, we wanted to take just a moment to kind of uh, situate people on uh, the site uh, and the facility. And uh, for this portion of the presentation, uh, Mark Anders from BCRC uh, will be taking the reins. So Mark. Hi everybody, This uh, I'm gonna show two maps. This is kind of an overview map and then we'll um, look a little closer in the next slide. Um, so this really shows that the site is really right in the heart of Bennington. Um, it is half a mile from the Four Corners, which, which is the intersection of Route 7 or Route 9, really the, that's the center of downtown. And it's 1.7 miles from Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, which is the largest <laughs> player in the region. Um, and maybe we can go to the next slide so we can talk about the immediate neighborhood. Um, so the the if you're familiar with walk score, um, the walk score for the facility is an 81, which is very walkable. Um, and their definition of that is most errands can be accomplished on foot. Um, and there's a really good uh, sidewalk network. Um, and right near is the um, Bennington Recreation Center, which has a swimming pool and tennis courts and has been recently renovated. Um, and there's also a, um, a bus station, um, the Green Mountain Express, which is um, right on Main Street on the left. And that has local bus service um, and regional bus service. And there's also a relatively new bus service that goes right to the Albany Rensselaer Amtrak station. Um, ticketing is right through Amtrak. And there's two buses a day. Um, and it's near the farmer's market. Um, so it's, uh, I think the big, the big picture is it's, uh, it's really, really walkable, a walkable neighborhood, um, with a lot of amenities right, right in, in the, uh, immediate area. So, um, maybe the next slide and the next person. Great. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll take this uh, portion back. As you can see, the facility, um, the energy of the site is made up of um, a few different parcels. Um, 321 gauge, which is a little under half an acre. 401 gauge, um, a little over six acres with 138,000 square feet of, of ground floors, 170,000 square feet um, of upper floors. Um, Zero Scott Street, which is uh, 1.6 acres, which is largely the parking facility for the plant. And then um, 211 Scott Street, which is another uh, acre. Uh, as most people are familiar, um, this um, there are actually buildings on both sides of, um, of Scott Street and the kind of a catwalk that connects the buildings, um, the, uh, walking, uh, going over uh, Scott Street. So kind of an interesting, again, urban setting in a residential neighborhood um, immediately adjacent to downtown and you know, really not the spot that you would likely um, cite a, um, an industrial facility uh, today. But you know, there it is. And um, you know, part, of, part of the challenge and opportunity here is, is figuring out kind of what comes next. So Callie. We'll just run through kind of a series of photos. This is from get on the left from Gage Street, kind of looking um, into the, the entry drive off of Gage, heading towards the facility on uh, the north side of Scott Street. Uh, the photo on the right uh, shows the uh, passageway between the two facilities. So that is looking westerly down Scott Street. Um, building on the left is along the river on the south side of Scott Street, building on the right is um, on the northerly side of Scott Street. Uh, photos of the parking lot. Um, again, those are uh, accessed um, off of um, Scott Street. Next one, Kelly. And again, the, this is uh, on the left-hand side, um, a shot from uh, the Gage Street side. 
uh, looking in and then a photo of uh, from Scott Street looking into the smaller parking lot on the um, westerly side of the building, which also now includes um, the area for uh, the compressed natural gas heating system uh, tanks that um, feed the building. So we thought it would be important to um, place the um, building in context vis-a-vis -vis the land use uh, regulations. Um, fortunately, um, there's some new information regarding these. Uh, Town of Bennington just went through a process of uh, updating uh, their land use regulations and uh, Kat Breyers from our office uh, was integral in assisting the town with that work. And we'll uh, talk about this component of the, uh, of the project. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, as Bill said, well, I'm, I'm Kat Breyers and I'm the director of planning at BCRC. And I had the pleasure of working with Bennington to update their uh, land use regulations for, for this area in particular. Um, so my job today is to give you guys a really high level uh, overview of the zoning. And the best place to start with that is to think outside of the borders of this energizer complex and, and think what is the land use regulation context for the neighborhood. And so as, as we've said, I think already a couple of times today, when we think about what that land use context is, it, it is certainly um, heavily residential. And you can see that in the, the shot of uh, a little selection of the um, zoning map here, uh, the yellow zone labeled VR for village residential that covers the north, uh, west and east of the Energizer complex. And really that's heavily residential. Permitted uses include single family homes, two family homes, and the only um, commercial use permitted in this area are bed and breakfast. Um, for those of you familiar with the area, living in the area, you, you know that there are a couple of corner stores um, really in the immediate vicinity of the Energizer complex, but those are grandfathered uses. So again, um, very heavily residential focus um, to the north, uh, west, and, and east of the Energizer property. Oops, excuse me. Um, when we look to the south of the complex, um, again, first thing to keep in mind is that the Walloonsack River is forming that you know, southern border as we think of the, the Energizer complex property. Um, but if you skip over the Walloonsack River, uh, you land in mixed use districts to the south and southeast. And certainly there's still a lot of um, heavily uh, heavy single residential uses uh, in, in this area, but also a lot of commercial. So we really do see a transition into mixed use and more heavier commercial use moving towards uh, the downtown. Um, of course, mixed use zones, meaning that a mixture of, of residential and commercial uses are encouraged. When we look at the Energizer property itself, which is you know right there in the middle labeled MU2 for mixed use two, Mixed use two is the zoning district, again, encouraging a mixture of uh, residential and commercial uses. Mm -hmm. Any use that's individually permitted uh, within the, mix, the mixed use two district uh, can be combined as a mixed use within a single structure. And any uses uh, permitted in, in that district do have to comply with performance standards that are outlined in the land use regulations. We can go on to the next slide. So when, uh, for, for those of you that have had the uh, pleasure of getting to walk the property, you know that uh, what jumps out at you immediately are the existing buildings that are so sizable, so close to downtown, really exciting. And uh, so when we think about how we can re reuse those existing facilities, another exciting aspect of it is that there is a streamlined review process for reuse of those buildings. So those are considered permitted uses. Again, they have a, a streamlined, simplified review process that doesn't require a public hearing. Um, and so uses that we can uh, uh, think about for as permitted uses for reusing these buildings as long as they don't require a substantial expansion of the existing footprint. Those would include housing um, with no uh, housing unit density limit, interestingly. Uh, food, drink, and entertainment, that means restaurant and bars, although notably those are not permitted to front on those primary residential streets to the north, uh, west, and east of the property and would have to be cited to front on that internal street, um, Scott Street Road that goes 
through the middle of the energizer complex. The same goes for a lodging facility. So a hotel could be considered for reuse of these sites, but um, it would have to front on that internal Scott Street Road. Uh, personal and professional services can also be considered as well as retail. Again, this is for reuse, we can consider retail. And those would be limited to stores up to 10,000 square feet per store. So in addition to those um, administrative review level uses, uh, some additional uses can be considered in these uh, existing buildings, although the review um, scrutiny is a little bit higher. So they do require development review board approval and a public hearing. Uh, and so those include a residential care facility, educational facilities, and manufacturing. What's definitely not permitted here is public parking and transit facilities. And speaking of parking, the parking requirements um, are just one space per residential unit. And for any non-residential use, there's actually no parking minimum at all, which is great news. Uh, next slide. So um, like I said, we love to walk the property for those of us that are able to and look at those big, gorgeous existing buildings and think about what can go in them. But uh, when you re really look at the aerial and you see a lot of open space and, and parking lot, there's also ample space for new construction. So what, what can we consider for new construction? New construction is different from reuse of existing buildings in that there does not exist that expedited administrative review permitting process. All new construction is subject to uh, conditional use review, DRB approval and a public hearing. Um, but we see those, those similar uses uh, that, are, that are up for consideration that um, housing without a density uh, limit, food, drink, entertainment and lodging that can front on Scott Street, those per personal and professional services and offices, residential care, education, manufacturing. Notably, what's missing from here from the previous slide is retail. So retail is only open for consideration uh, as a reuse of existing historic buildings and new buildings um, would not be suitable uh, to, to be used for retail under the, the current zoning. Again, uh, parking facilities are not permitted. And with the town's uh, latest revision to their zoning, there was a lot of focus on the built form of new buildings and how uh, lots uh, could, be, could be designed to serve the community. So along those lines, uh, there is a quarter uh, acre, 10,000 square foot minimum lot size, 80 foot minimum lot width. Buildings can cover up to 65% of a lot and buildings can be 40 feet tall. The same parking requirements that I mentioned before apply. There's uh, one space required per, per residential dwelling unit, but no parking required, no minimum parking required for non-residential uses. And uh, there's um, also minimum glazing requirements. So a minimum amount of transparent glass that, that should be included on the facades of newly constructed buildings. And that's it for my uh, high overview of, of the zoning that applies to this project. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Kat. I'd like to, I'd like to pause here for just a second. Um, Kat has to has to leave for um, another public meeting um, later this evening. Um, so I just thought would like to just see if there are any questions um, on the kind of zoning components relative to the site and the uh, project. Um, just wanted to make sure before um, we lose our expert on the topic that. Um, See if anybody has any questions. So if you could raise your hand if you do, virtually, ideally. Um, I see a hand from uh, Adam McCarville. Adam? Uh, yeah, is there, a, um, is there a current floor area ratio that's like instated in this um, current like zoning of this area or um, has that not been decided yet? Um, no, there, there is no, uh, for residences, no unit density limit. So if it complies with building codes, then um, then that density works for this zone. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Bruce Learman. Bruce, did you have a question? I see a see a virtual hand. I believe your audio isn't coming through, Bruce. You're not muted, but it's not muted. Through. Okay, try this. Can you hear me now? There you go. Perfect. 
Okay. Uh, is there a prohibition on on street parking included in the public parking prohibition? Public parking prohibition. Sorry, can you explain? What yeah, you, you said not on the slide. It's not permitted for public parking or transit facilities. Oh. I wonder if that also includes on street parking. No, sorry. Good clarification, Bruce. That is referring to like a centralized um parking public parking facility like a public parking lot um that would be off street right thank you mm -hmm. terrific any other questions on the zoning or land use front great thanks very much uh and thank you cap um so we'll move on obviously an important um kind of um really always interesting part of these projects is looking at the existing economic and demographic trends. Uh, so we're gonna walk through just kind of some high level initial findings from that work. This work is being done in conjunction um, with between uh, work between our office and uh, Camoin 310. So within our office, um, the lead on the economic and demographic work is uh, Jonathan Cooper. So I believe Jonathan's gonna start uh, this section and then work uh, Turn it over to Dan Stevens from Camoin 310. All right, uh, thanks very much, Bill. <clears throat> um, so hello, everyone. I'm kind of glad to have the opportunity to present a couple of uh, these sort of key trends we've identified, some interesting data points to take with you. Um, and really thinking back to what we just saw from CAT, we saw what are residential contexts this facility is in, in the photographs that Bill walked through um, after Mark presented some of the mapping elements. We saw parking lots that look right at houses. We see residential scale next to imposing facades. And so that makes some of the conversations we're gonna have um, for, between me and for Dan, um, pretty helpful for sort of contextualizing where the site sits in the midst of our, of our own backyards. But to begin with, I think that it's probably no secret that Bennington's population is declining. That's sort of where a lot of our conversations these days are circulating and an issue that's sort of on everyone's mind. Um, we hit our peak from a, census perspective in 1990 at about 16 and a half thousand individuals um, and we sit now at probably about 15,100 or so we won't really know the number from the 2020 census until a little bit uh, about a year from now and when we do know that number we'll be wondering just how much of the pandemic relocation uh, that captured or how little it captured and we don't quite know how that echo is going to play out but in the trends that we see before us um, we see that we're trending downward largely because of what's called natural, um, natural trends, that we are not bringing in more people and we are not having more babies. But uh, there is a bit of a Bennington boom to talk about, and that is down in Gen Z, uh, people born between 1999 and 2016 is about the same size as our share of baby boomers here in town. So we do have some up and coming individuals who are grade school age and beyond uh, into the early stages of the workforce. Um, but it is very much a question that we'll be asking for some time to come as to how to shore up our population. And also something for us to think about tonight is if we have 1,500 fewer people now, how is it that we have a housing crunch? And hopefully the next slides will help illustrate that. Um, can we move to the next one then? So there's two geographies that I'll be talking about um, throughout the, the remainder of my slides. One is the town, which I think we all are aware of in terms of its dimensions. The other is what I will refer to loosely as the downtown. It's not exactly the way that we might draw a downtown map if we each had um, the opportunity in front of us with a pencil and a map. But this is a census tract that pretty neatly covers uh, that you see there in the photograph all of our downtown area, um, and then a little bit to the east, a little bit to the west, but it's very much a good uh, substitute for downtown as we all might consider it. And so here are just some of the more broader data points and how they compare. We know that we have about a third of the population in the downtown, slightly older than the town-wide figure, fewer children, uh, substantially less prosperity. And, but the most important data points here have to do with the housing dynamics of rentals and multi-unit residents. Um, where townwide, you know, it's very much in the minority to live in a multi-unit house, to uh, be renting instead of owning. It's decidedly, in, you know, the, the more likely of those options uh, in the downtown. And of course, those townwide figures include the preponderance of renting in multi-unit residences that are in the downtown. That if we were to compare the downtown to the rest of the town, the contrast would be even starker. So we have a slightly different housing dynamic here than we have elsewhere through town, which bears consideration as uh, we continue on with our slides. Um, for the next one then, please. 
which pertains to income. And this is an interesting one um, because we see just how much can change in a decade. Uh, this runs from 2011 to 2019. We see in the dashed line in the middle, the median household income in the town of Bennington. And it jumped by about 20 or 25% from 40,000 to 50,000 in that time, which is a good thing to see. But what's really interesting is that when we break down renters versus owners, and then we break down renters in the downtown and owners in the downtown versus renters and owners outside of the downtown or townwide, we see a real uh, two very different, some different tales emerging. Um, we know generally that owners will out earn renters, but it's interesting to see in that orange line that renters are catching up, that um, their median household income, if you rented in Bennington, it grew by about 40%. Uh, if you owned in Bennington, it grew by 11%. So a little bit of a gap closure there, which is of interest to us, but the downtown missed out on that growth. The gray line represents the last decade in terms of income for um, owners living in the downtown. And the yellow line represents renters in the downtown. Um, and what's most remarkable about this slide is that how in 2011, they were at the same levels. Uh, income in the downtown and the town wide were roughly equal, whether you rented or owned, but that's played out very differently over the last decade. So we know that we have a shifting population in terms of age demographics, a shifting population in terms of overall numbers of people. And now we see income sort of separating out the downtown for the rest of the town. If we move to the next slide then, we'll get a look at um, how family households have sort of adjusted over time. This is the same time scale, and there's two big bars that you can see there. Um, the Lowest one, this is about family households by type, and the biggest buckets are considered family and non-family, and they break them down from there. Um, married couples, sort of the American Gothic image, is down there at the bottom, and that's the largest single share. Uh, it was about 42% in 2011, but it's decreased to about 35% townwide um, in the last decade. The yellow portion above is people who are living alone, um, and that has increased slightly, but it is now about 35%. So just about an equal amount of households contain one person living by themselves as contain a married couple, whether they have children or not. Um, the largest increase was the gain in households that are uh, headed up by a female head of household in a family situation, but with um, no spouse present. And that jumped from about 13% to 16%. These numbers don't necessarily indicate um, major trends that we need to be taking lots of uh, time to explore, but we do see that the kind of family structures, generally speaking, have been trending, have been shifting over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, and those changes continue, and it affects a little bit of what kind of spaces people will need, what kind of living arrangements are preferable to people. If we can move to our uh, my final slide, we'll get a sense of just how adaptable we might consider the town of Bennington's current housing stock. There's two pie charts there. One is a stock by type, the other is the stock by age. And on the right, we see that most of our housing um, is from either a time from when George Washington was president all the way up to when before Don Kennedy became president. That half of our housing stock predates 1960. Um, primarily it's pre-war housing, but it moves all the way up into 1960. And then as you recall, our population peaking in 1990 was growing throughout that post-war era. About a quarter of our housing stock dates from that 1960 to 1980 period. And it slowed down between 1980 and 2000 as some of the dynamics pro um, prompting growth in Bennington began to slow down. And you can see in the last 20 years, really we've accounted for a, a very small portion of our existing housing stock. But as you might expect then, our housing stock primarily caters to single units. And um, there's relatively few structures that are duplexes, that are apartments of three to nine units, uh, relative paucity of anything between 10 and 19, so that most of our stock is in what you might consider single family dwellings. Um, and most of our stock is more than 50 years old. And so most of our stock is from a time when family dynamics looked a little different. So sort of as my way, before I hand it off to Dan, what I want to sort of summarize with was that we've seen that Bennington's population is changing. Bennington's household dynamics are changing. Bennington's income or outlook is changing sort of spatially. And so the time is sort of nigh for us to consider whether or not our housing stock needs to make, what adjustments can be made to that housing stock to better reflect the needs of the residents that we have and the residents that we hope to have to shore up what is projecting now to be a population decline of serious proportion. So. Uh, on that happy note, I'll turn it over to Dan from Good Morning. Thanks very much, Dan. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, I'm with Kamoin 310, uh, <clears throat> representing the consultant team that's uh, been invited to work on this project. And uh, we're all very excited to be a part of this redevelopment effort and the, the broader housing needs assessment uh, as well. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna pick up uh, where Jonathan uh, was kind of leaving off with some additional uh, looks at some of the data analysis um, that we've been doing as part of this effort. <clears throat> uh, you'll see here uh, that we're looking at migration patterns. And I know this chart is a little bit hard to read, but essentially what you're looking at uh, in the blue side here are those people uh, moving into Bennington County. And on the red side, uh, people moving away from Bennington County. Uh, so this is just you know one year in time. This is 2019. Um, but, uh, you know, we look at these types of migration trends to, um, you know, understand a number of things, but, you know, on the housing side of things, for example, uh, you know, it's helpful to understand, you know, where are people coming from and, you know, what types of people are we um, talking about? What, you know, what are the nature of these households? Um, you know, in terms of household size, household income, what type of housing uh, does that mean that they're most likely uh, to be interested in? Um, so you'll see here, you know, the top four counties uh, that people are coming from, moving into Bennington, Wyndham, Rensselaer, Berkshire, and Rutland uh, are the same four that people uh, are moving away from Bennington too. So uh, you, you see here kind of you're swapping, um, you know, people with surrounding uh, counties. Um, but again, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, this is a wash in terms of housing needs, housing opportunities. Um, because you, it requires thinking a little bit more about the types of people coming in. You know, what are the patterns of people coming in? Are they seniors coming in, young people moving out? Is it vice versa? Uh, and how does that, uh, you know, how do those trends align with the housing stock uh, that's available? And again, this is just one year in time. Uh, we're also digging into you know, more recently, of course, post COVID, uh, people leaving higher, you know, higher rent metro areas, moving to more rural uh, communities. Um, you know, that's certainly a trend, you know, um, the data is still new on that, but there are some interesting sources that we look at uh, in terms of things like postal service data and so on. Um, so we'll be digging deeper into that and the opportunities to potentially capture those types of uh, remote workers. Uh, so if we could move on to the next one, please. Um, so it's kind of similar to migration patterns. We're also looking at commuting patterns. So more on the day-to-day -day basis, the people that are driving into Bennington, working and leaving at the end of the day. And, you know, those people that are also living in the town, but leaving the town for work and coming back at the end of the day. So uh, the graphic here you're looking at is showing a little over 5,200 people uh, living outside of Bennington, commuting into the town every day for employment. Uh, that 2,740 uh, 2, figure, those are the people uh, living in Bennington and, of course, commuting out to uh, other jobs. Um, and then the 3,600 plus folks are living and working in town. So the commuting data is often interesting to look at, particularly where people are coming from, where they're going. You know, the 5,200 is a number of you know, the people coming in, um, but not living in the community. You know, those are always people of interest. Um, you know, obviously people live uh, where they do for all sorts of reasons, um, but housing, housing availability, housing cost, um, you know, the right type of housing is one piece of that equation. And so we're always looking to see, uh, you know, is there a portion of those people that are not living in Bennington because the right housing uh, is simply not available uh, and perhaps would live in Bennington uh, if, the, if that housing was available. So this is how it starts to inform um, thinking about housing needs, housing uh, market opportunities. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
We also take a close look at economic trends um, for a couple reasons. You know, we're certainly exploring non-residential uses. I mean, we heard about you know zoning. There's certainly things that are allowed and not allowed, um, but there are potential commercial uh, opportunities and and other types of non-residential opportunities for Energizer uh, redevelopment. And so, we look at these types of industry growth trends. Uh, you know, what are the individual and specific sectors, and in this case, uh, this chart we're looking at Bennington County, uh, that have been growing, you know, these are bright economic spots, uh, and so we try to identify what those bright spots are um, as opportunities to further grow, and, you know, when we think about real estate development, uh, these are sectors that are perhaps uh, go going to be in need of space in the future. Um, so we're, you know, we're looking at things starting at the top, and this is from 2009 to 2019, colleges, universities, and professional schools. Um, with the most significant growth uh, in Bennington County. Obviously, there have been some notable uh, educational closures throughout Vermont. Um, but again, here in Bennington, for this time frame, uh, a bright spot. Uh, management of companies and enterprises. Um, you know, that's another one. And this is kind of one of those, you know, highly desirable sectors as well. Um, so think uh, company headquarters uh, is essentially what this one is, um, seeing growth in the county. <clears throat> A number of manufacturers, uh, fan manufacturing sectors on this list as well. Uh, right, most of the communities in the Northeast uh, losing manufacturing jobs. Um, not many places have growing um, manufacturing sectors. So again, some bright spots and some, uh, you know, potential opportunities, um, not just economic and, you know, maybe not talking about manufacturing businesses, but, um, you know, service providers for those businesses, uh, employees that need housing for these types of businesses. Um, you know, these are all things that we take a close look at. Um, and then just another one to point out the residential care facilities. So that's um, a type of senior housing, typically another one of those growing sectors. Uh, you know, as the population of the county continues to age, you know, this is the type of thing that you would expect to, to see, um, you know, services, um, care, um, housing for um, an aging population. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on, please. So also on the economic vein here, uh, we take a close look at, and we're looking at two things here really, uh, but the largest industries, but specifically the wage levels within those industries. So what are typical salaries, wages that people are taking home? Uh, and this is the town of Bennington in this case. Uh, you know, what is their take home pay and what does that mean for uh, the things that, um, you know, they'll be shopping for does their discretionary income, but it also plays into, again, uh, housing needs and housing affordability and, you know, what are the price points for certain housing types, um, you know, that align with uh, local wage levels that people can, you know, reasonably um, attain. So you see this orange line here, that's the average uh, town wage of about 43,000. Um, and a couple notable sectors, large sectors uh, with wage levels well above that. So uh, towards the top, the third one down there, um, the ambulatory healthcare services. So things like uh, outpatient care centers, urgent care, um, you know, these types of things. Uh, and then another bright spot uh, down at the bottom with 118 jobs, uh, credit intermediation and related activities, which I'm guessing is maybe one or two businesses, but still, you know, a bright spot um, in the town in terms of uh, wage levels. So this is the type of data we'll dig into, you know, further understanding, you know, current wage levels, uh, how those wages are growing, um, looking at those growing industry sectors and how that translates into economic and market opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. So we've looked at some economic demographic uh, data. This is uh, some data that we look at on the housing market side. Uh, so in the gray, these gray bars we're looking at, um, that's essentially the rent, uh, rent levels that we're 
looking at. Uh, this chart is for Bennington County. Um, so sticking with these gray bars for a minute, uh, you can see that you know, essentially year to year, rents have been uh, increasing, seeing pretty steady growth all the way from 2011 through 2020 and even into uh, this year. <clears throat> now, the green line we're looking at uh, is the vacancy rate. And that's something we take a close look at when we're looking at uh, housing market conditions and opportunities. Uh, because it tells us a lot about the balance of supply and demand. Uh, not everything, uh, obviously, but it tells a story. And you see here, um, the vacancy rate has gone from, you know, um, around 3% down to even, you know, closer to uh, 2% uh, where we are now trending. Um, <clears throat> with a little bit of a, a bump in, in the 2021 um, data, um, but generally a uh, trending downwards vacancy rate. Um, you know, when we see this, it starts to indicate that, uh, you know, the market is tightening, um, you know, supply may not necessarily be keeping up with demand. And so there may be opportunity and a need for additional uh, housing. Um, you know, typically when we talk about vacancy rates for, uh, apartments, um, you know, we're thinking, you know, generally 5% is a good rule of thumb. Um, you know, 5%, you're kind of at a healthy level and under 5%, which, you know, clearly you can see that we are here. Um, you know, that tells us that the market is in that kind of um, a little bit mismatched, a little bit tight, um, needing some more uh, units. Um, you know, 0% um, percent vacancies. Um, isn't typically a, a realistic target, 5%, um, if you're wondering, just kind of accounts for that um, kind of, we call it frictional un, um, vacancy. So kind of allows people to go in and out of apartments and generally is what you're looking for in the housing market. Uh, let's uh, keep going, please. So we're also taking a look at housing prices and if you're in the housing market this year, I'm sorry, but uh, you're very familiar with these numbers, uh, I'm sure. Um, you can see, and so we're looking 2016 to 2021 here. Um, these are county numbers, but uh, you can see very clearly that upward trend, um, particularly uh, in the past year or so, uh, in housing prices. And these are you know, single family owner occupied homes that we're looking at uh, here. So if you go back to 2019, uh, May of 2019, uh, typical median uh, home price was about 260,000. Uh, if you jump forward to uh, just a couple months ago in May, 2021, uh, that's 330. Uh, thousand for that same kind of typical median priced home in Bennington County. So when you start to see a, that kind of price increase of 28%, um, you know that something uh, pretty substantial is going on. And of course, if you've been following the news, you know that uh, the housing market is uh, you know, what, um, very constrained, low inventory, um, a lot of things playing into um, that fact. Um, but, you know, that's the reality that we're in now. And, you know, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, all expectations are that's not going to be as uh, obscenely um, high forever. But, um, you know, we may not necessarily get down to where we were before. And so, you know, that says a lot about future housing needs and affordability moving forward. Uh, I think we've got one more slide here, if we could go on to that one. Uh, which is telling a similar story, uh, right? So right now on this slide, we're taking a look at downtown specifically. So for uh, home sale prices in the downtown Bennington area, uh, you know, not only the same story, but an even more significant uh, increase. So again, looking at our kind of two year spread of uh, June, uh, this time 2021, uh, about two hundred fifty thousand for your median, um, your median typical uh, priced home. Uh, that same home was only one hundred fifty two thousand two years ago in June two thousand nineteen. Um, again, looking at median, you know, median home prices. Um, so that's sixty three percent, right? And so those kind of jumps 
um, put those homes out of reach of a lot of folks. Um, and so that has implications again for uh, how the community plans for uh, you know, future housing needs, uh, maintaining and growing its population and on the real estate, uh, real estate side uh, as well. You know, it poses uh, opportunities and um, you know, certainly creates uh, demand for uh, certain types of uh, housing product. So we've shared a, a good amount of data. These, this is to get you, um, I guess, familiar with some of the things that we're looking at, uh, that we're digging into, some of the initial things that we're finding. Um, but in addition to some of these uh, data points, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, you know, there's also a survey out right now, which is going to give us a lot of uh, great real-time uh, data. And so I'll turn things over to Callie to share a little bit more about that. Great, thanks. Um, so as Dan just mentioned, as part of the public engagement process, BCRC developed a survey with Camoin 310 to assess the housing needs of Bennington and um, potential reuses of the Energizer facility. The survey was released to the public on July 7th, and it will be open until this Friday. So if you haven't taken it yet, you have a couple days to do so, so please do that. Um, so these first few slides here, are just um, a bit of information about the respondents who have taken the survey so far. And again, these are just um, preliminary survey results. Once we've uh, concluded the survey, we'll have a full digest of the results. Um, but that you can see in this chart here that um, the most um, popular household size of respondents is two person household, followed by a uh, one person household. Um, and in this slide, you can see that a majority of survey respondents are year round residents of Bennington, either they own their own home, 62%, uh, or uh, are renters at 31%. Um, this question asks uh, respondents to rank a series of housing issues on a scale of one to five and how critical they are uh, to Bennington, uh, what least critical to most critical. Um, and these uh, issues listed down here are the ones that were most commonly ranked as most critical. So 52% of respondents said that affordability of housing is, was the most critical. 40% said that lack of available rentals uh, is most critical, and 34% of respondents said that quality of rentals is the most critical housing issue in Bennington. Um, this chart here, I know it might be a little bit hard to see, but the question was, uh, what are the most important factors when choosing where to live? And respondents were asked to choose up to three. And what you can see on this chart here is that um, the most commonly chosen factors were walkability, um, community and neighborhood feel, quality of housing, and access to goods and services. Um, this question asks broadly how the Energizer facility should be reused. Um, there are subsequent questions in the survey that ask um, more specifically um, how respondents think the Energizer facility should be reused within each of these categories. Um, but as you can see, this chart shows um, that the most um, popular broad reuse option right now is housing at nearly 60%. And uh, this question asks more specifically what type of housing respondents would like to see at the Energizer facility. Um, and the, the labels are a bit cut off on the chart here, but um, well, you can see that the most um, popular types of housing that respondents said they wanted to see in the Energizer facility were rentals for persons with low to moderate income, uh, housing geared towards Bennington's workforce, um, and senior housing. And I also just wanted to uh, briefly mention this other category down at the bottom here, because um, about 25% of respondents did select other and write in their responses. Um, and the most common write-in responses were people who wanted to see a mix of one or more of these uh, housing options above here. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that the survey will be open until this Friday, July 23rd. Uh, you can access it via a link on the homepage of the BCRC website, uh, bcrcbt.org, uh, or a link on the Facebook page. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, Dan, uh, and Callie. And as I noted up front, um, 
we do want to get a brief um, environmental update on kind of the status of where uh, things from the environmental front uh, stand from Christy Herzer from Vermont DEC, but we just threw a whole bunch of information uh, at you. So this might be a good time um, to see if there are any questions on uh, the data or uh, the survey. Understanding that, you know, early stages uh, on, on, well, later stages on the survey, but still early stages, um, this information uh, will be synthesized, um, analyzed, and really um, help to inform the, uh, re the suggestions uh, and feasibility analyses that come later uh, in this project. But that's kind of the stage that we're at. So uh, questions, I see a hand from uh, Jonathan Fitz. Hi, um, yes, I saw the data for uh, the amount of uh, incoming people working in not only commuting to Bennington, but also the amount of incoming people that moved into Bennington. And like you had it broken down at one point by uh, employment also. Like, do you have like, um, uh, I, I work for the SVSU. I was wondering if you have it, um, if you have like those numbers just off of per um, employer specific, or is it just like by a overall like a, a sector? Yeah, this is uh, Jonathan, thanks for your question. This is Dan, um, Bill, I can, um, I can respond. Um, sure. Yeah, the, the short answer is that we don't have it broken down by individual um, employer. So it is kind of, um, it's a little bit more broad. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, Dan. Other questions on the data? I don't see. See any? Uh, oh, I do see one. Okay, uh, Eves, question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Just a quick question on that. Uh, the chart that showed the price of housing, so you know, home sales. Uh, both the charts that were shown had a very heavy spike in 2017. It seemed to match. The pricing we're seeing right now and i'm just curious if anybody knows why in 2017 that occurred because it it looks like a bit of an aberration so um jonathan or dan any any insights any thoughts um I, I can take I don't have a I don't have a real answer to that. Um, we see those kind of anomalies happen in the data. Um, sometimes they're meaningful. Sometimes, um, you know, if a small subdivision of, you know, more expensive homes was complete and there was a cluster of home sales in that year, um, you know, that can be enough to create that kind of, of spike. Um, so it's not necessarily um, you know, some type of structural thing, but it's kind of a one-time impact. But um, I would just be, I would just be speculating as to what happened um, specifically in Bennington at that time frame. And I, I would suggest one other thing we'll want to look at is cross-referencing this against the number of sales in any given year. Um, if that happened to be a particularly low sales year, any given sale can really um, have undue influences kind of on, on that data. So that's the type of that stuff that we'll cross-reference as we as we really dive into the, analyzing the uh, the data. Uh, Jean Connor. Thanks. Um, I'm sure that you will be diving into, if you haven't already, into the impact that housing in this facility will impact Bennington Elementary School with enrollment and so on. Can you speak to that at all? Uh, so, I mean, that, that certainly will be, you know, there would be a projection just based on uh, typical household size um, as to what the implications might be for the school system. Um, but, you know, we, we would take a, obviously take a look at that and, and see what that looks like. Interestingly, um, you know, it's going to largely depend upon the nature of the housing there. Um, there would be much less impact on the school system if there was a majority of senior related housing or smaller units that would be appropriate for single people. So the housing mix, in addition to the number of units there is gonna have you know, some significant impacts on the possibility of implications for the school system. 
Any other questions? Data survey. Great. Um, so we'll um, move on for an update from uh, Christy uh, Herzer at uh, Vermont DEC. Christy oversees uh, a lot of the sites management activity uh, for Vermont DEC, and in this case, um, is the lead on the uh, Energizer site. So, Christy, maybe you could just give a brief background on uh, environmental status at the site. It's always uh, of interest. Uh, as well as kind of what might be expected from Energizer as they wind down operations and, and move to, to market the property. So, Christy, sure thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so again, I'm Christy Herzer. Uh, I work for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, the Energizer degreasing facility is one of my contaminated sites that I manage. Um, so I'll try to give you a very high overview of this project. Um, so it has been a listed site um, with the DEC since 2006 due to solvent degreasing um, activities. A lot, a lot, a lot of environmental investigation and remediation has happened um, on and around this property since then. Uh, but most recently, um, they did some additional site investigation last year in July, October, and uh, December to investigate um, groundwater and soil gas. Um, and so now site investigation um, activities are completed. Um, there are you know, issues with uh, chlorinated solvents in the groundwater and soil gas. And so the next uh, stage, the next um, activity that will happen is that uh, an evaluation of corrective action alternatives is going to be drafted. And what that means is that the environmental professional will take all of the, the data that they've collected about the, the site and um, in consideration with potential redevelopment opportunities, come up with multiple plans of how to address the contamination um, so that human health and the environment are protected essentially. Uh, and so um, I'm anticipating you know, receiving that draft evaluation of corrective action alternatives in the next uh, month or so. Um, and so once, once I review that and, you know, either agree with their assessment or have some comments, then they can move on to the corrective action plan, which will lay out what will need to happen um, so that you know, this redevelopment can occur. And, and effectively, the, the overarching um, issues are um, vapor intrusion mitigation. So contamination that's in the groundwater can percolate up through the soil and get into buildings. We don't want that to happen. So the, e the evaluation of corrective action alternatives will address that. Um, and then a long-term monitoring strategy um, for groundwater contamination and potential need for institutional controls to make sure that you know we're monitoring and uh, recording every year what's going on on the property. Um, and then sort of in tandem, this uh, project also um, has a RICRA closure plan, which is the Resource Conservation and uh, Recovery Act uh, because of um, materials used on the, on the property at the facility. Um, and so their closure plan was approved and they're in the process of um, getting the buildings uh, cleaned up and getting that plan sorted out. Um, so that is uh, moving along and it's a multiple, uh, multiple month process, but that is also moving forward. So I hope I didn't get too much into the weeds there. I tried to do a mix, um, but so things are moving along from DEC's perspective for this site. Terrific, thanks very much, Christy. And as I noted um, earlier, um, all of this work is being done by separate uh, environmental consultants. We will attempt to summarize and bring into the final uh, reuse plan um, as, as an appendix, most likely uh, kind of a summary of, of the work that's being done on the environmental side. So with that, um, we'd like to turn it over to, um, to you folks, uh, the people who have taken time out of their evenings to join us and kind of hear an update and spend the next 25 minutes or so. Um, Kind of talking um, really about two general questions and you know we've seen some preliminary results from the survey um, i think all along we have assumed that uh, at least some component of the energizer site um, made sense to be reutilized as housing um, i think the question that perhaps we've been struggling more with is and what else um, so 
uh, with that in mind, um, we'd like to open it up uh, for your thoughts as to what other usage you'd like to see um, at the former Energizer facility, as well as really, uh, we can take them at the same time. Are there any other, any uses that you specifically would not like to see uh, at the site? I think both of those, um, input on both of those is valuable. So um, opening it up to the floor to see if folks have thoughts uh, in that regard. And again, put, putting these in context, I think Kat did a good job of providing an overview of um, permitted uses and, um, and potentially permissible uses uh, at the site. So we do wanna kind of keep those in mind. Uh, so I see, um, I see perhaps old hands from Eves and Jonathan. Um, I'll give you a chance to take those down if they're old. If you leave them up, I'll come loop back to you. But I do see a new hand from uh, Sarah Jane Krinsky. So let's start there. Sarah Jane? Hi. Um, yeah, so I, I think definitely um, keeping in lines of a mixed use space, you know, um, something that I think I feel would be really valuable to this downtown areas, just adding some more area attractions. Um, so I feel like, you know, in that immediate downtown, we have the, you know, I guess coming into Bennington, you have the monument, you've got the Bennington Museum, um, you know, the theater, but really trying to have something else for when people, for locals and for people that are in the area. So seeing something like a, a science museum or in some arts related type museum, um, I think would be really beneficial. I mean, we are sort of in this art belt kind of in between what's going on, you know, in the Clark and Mass Mocha. Um, so really seeing maybe something along those lines that's again, also ed an educational opportunity. Um, so, yeah. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Phipps, sorry, we have a couple of times. Um, so I actually work for the SVSU. I'm the equity coordinator. And one of my jobs is to try and is over the next five years to attract new, young, diverse talent to the SVSU. That being said, like I myself took this job in January, late January, and my initial plan was to move into the Bennington area. Of course, however, with the recent uh, well, COVID and housing market this insanity, that's the only way I could describe it. I basically had to settle and, you know, now we own a nice house in Troy, much to my chagrin. I would have loved to move into Bennington because then I would not have to endure a one hour work on back roads. That said, one of the things that I think the Energizer facility should be used for primarily is to have um, affordable multi-unit, like multi-family, or excuse me, family housing that is primarily tailored to be towards like municipal workers. I say that because I, as somebody who is the equity coordinator who's whose goal is to, is to hire diverse and young staff at the SVSU and keep them at the SVSU for as long as possible. It's a very hard sell to, you know, um, convince a 25-year-old who or 24, 23-year-old who just got their master's degree to move into Bennington when they can't afford a house because they're 23 or 24 years old and they just got their master's degree, or they can't afford the rentals and the rentals they can't afford, guess what? They're not up to the standard that your average typical, you know, looking to start a family eventually more professionally 23 24 year old person would want to move into so i think like the energizer facility should focus primarily on that that demographic um one suggestion i do have that i haven't heard that was brought up on um, i'm originally from the state of maryland specifically the city of baltimore um the city of baltimore had an interesting program in which like if you were a teacher or a municipal worker for the city of baltimore and you wanted to, and you wanted to rent an apartment or uh, uh, or any type in Baltimore City. They had a program in which, like, you would get, I think it was like a 15% markdown from rental rate from the apartment. So, if, like, you know, or it was let's just say 10% because it makes it easier for my brain. I'm not good in that. So basically, if the apartment costs a thousand dollars and you were a school employee, that apartment, because of this program that the city did, was now only nine hundred dollars. To you. That was a way to basically infuse a bunch of young talent and a bunch of young um, individuals to move into Baltimore City, increase the tax base of the city because Baltimore City was actually desperate for tax base. It does have a similar uh, similar uh, issue that Bennington does of a very sharply decreasing population that's also aging over a protracted period of time. And I think these sort of these sort of programs are the things that we really should be looking at and discussing because as an equity coordinator and as somebody's going to be trying to go to like University of Albany and other local schools in my area, uh, are, you know, uh, Russell Sage, it's very hard for me to convince 
young um, graduates, young, highly educated and, you know, capable graduates who are going to have good paying jobs over a protracted period of time to stay, to move and to accept a job in Bennington when they can't afford a decent apartment, there's not much to do. So mixed use would be a great thing. And at the same time, there's no hope for a housing, uh, acquiring housing in the area. So just leaving that with you there. Terrific. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, Adam. Uh, hi, uh, Jonathan just made a really good point about how like coming out of college, um, one of the worries is, of course, um, affording. I mean, um, clearly we're seeing the trend, but I, I would uh, actually recommend that um, uh, with the idea of mixed use and having houses there, um, I, I, perhaps co-housing is a, is a solid idea. Um, I know that's been done with uh, I believe in um, uh, parts of well Vancouver, um, and that's I did a case study on that where that was specifically done with college students where um, you're able to afford those units on a on a bit better scale because you're actually all have a stake in the actual unit. You have a stake in the um, interconnected and more community based uh, living space. So that means that everybody has access to public spaces within the community. Everybody has access to, um, you know, the same types of living spaces, mixed income also. But the important part is that everybody has a stake in the area and meaning that everyone feels just as important and just as included within that, um, uh, within the units. Terrific, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Adam. Is that uh, Vancouver, um, Canada or Washington that you referenced? Um, uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada. And, right. and that's just uh, a very, very well planned city. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Donald Campbell. Donald. Thanks, Bill. Everything uh, Jonathan and Adam just said is so totally true and all the housing stuff that has been talked about is completely true. And clearly we have to do a lot on housing. But I, I am interested in your question about what else, you know, do we want to try to do there? And I thought um, Sarah was on to some kind of good thoughts there. Uh, you know, one of the initiatives that, that I hoped was going to get off the ground and didn't uh, was Matthew's dirty art space. Um, you know, the idea of having a sort of creation space uh, went on the board. I can't tell you how many times I heard people say there's nothing for kids to do in the winter. Uh, there's lots to do in the summer and there's lots of places to go, but the, the winter time is tough. And if you're not a skier or something like that, if you don't embrace the uh, cold outdoors, it's tough. So I know it's hard to get people to come do these things, Bill. And I know you've been struggling with that with the Putnam block. Like it's a great idea to have a store, but who's gonna run the store? Um, but if on the wish list, we could have things like dirty art space or um, a climbing wall, you know, some sort of, I don't really know what the inside of that space looks like. I, I never have gotten in there, but if they're really unique spaces that, you know, like a big tall space that doesn't work for housing, but might be a phenomenal climbing wall, it'd be great to um, do some kind of opportunistic thinking about recreation with, with an eye towards what, what would younger, um, all people, but, but especially younger people really um, find uh, compelling to do in the in the non-summer months. Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Uh, other thoughts, ideal uses, things to avoid, any other general questions, comments? Uh, Shannon. Along the same lines of, I was thinking the same thing that Donald and Sarah were, and just wondering if part of the um, process with the consultant, I guess this question would be for Dan, is if you'll be looking at other sort of similar sized communities to Bennington and what folks have done in those communities with giant abandoned spaces um, to get some good ideas. myself off mute. Uh, yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah, that is part of the process. I mean, we've worked in a number of uh, other communities and other kind of industrial complexes. And, you know, we've seen things like uh, what Donald is talking about, uh, you know, indoor recreational concepts, um, you know, creative things, indoor mountain biking, for example. Um, so yeah, yeah, there, is a, there are a number of things we've seen worked. Um, 
you know, it kind of goes back to what makes sense, um, you know, given, uh, you know, if we're expecting housing to be a significant part of the redevelopment, what makes sense, um, you know, are there things that can serve as uh, an amenity, perhaps for different, um, you know, future types of tenants, um, you know, and then keeping in mind, of course, that, you know, this take this will take a lot of private investment. And so, you know, that we have to think about what's feasible from a private sector point of view. Um, you know, certainly not to say that uh, community uses, recreational uses are off the table by any means. Um, you know, certainly they can enhance value and generate revenue themselves. Um, so you know, there are a lot of things on the table. There's a lot of things, creative things that we've seen um, work successfully that you know we'll be we'll be exploring and, and bring to the table. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, Jonathan, um, see your hand again. So please, because um, I I think Bruce hasn't gone yet. I'll defer to him, and then you can get back to me. Okay, we'll loop back, Bruce. Thank yeah, you. I got Thanks, you. Can you hear me now? I. Uh, we can. Okay. There's uh, one thing I'd like to uh, emphasize is that particularly at this day and age, uh, considering what DEC is looking at and uh, the, the nature of the world today, it would be a great shame if we did not develop the building in ways that were as energy efficient as possible. And of course, that's a primary concern for me, but, uh, and I know that great strides are being made in other places in terms of how you, how you can rehab older buildings for uh, net zero or net plus energy efficiency. There's programs I've seen in Chicago that were amazing in terms of energy production within the building space. So obviously that's a big concern for me. The second thing I'd like to reemphasize is what Adam said about the possibilities of co-housing or co-ownership. It seems to me that that's a very uh, promising idea for many of the kinds of problems we're talking about with the, you know, the vast discrepancies between income and cost is to uh, advance a, uh, a better standard of ownership in, uh, in developing the property. That's all, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Bruce. Um, Jonathan, um, we'll jump back to you. Thank you for deferring. Um, so one other thing that I want like to see if things go ahead, um, things that are kind of like workforce multipliers, the easiest one I could think of on off the top of my head is childcare. Whatever we put in a building like that, you would want something that could make the workforce in the surrounding area that much more effective. Um, I noticed um, when we were going over the demographics, the, the, I think it was either the largest or second largest group was the, uh, gen was the generation after mine. I'm a millennial. I forget what the one after mine is called. I'm already crankety and a crotchety old man. But like, um, they're going to start to have kids soon, or if they're not already having kids already. Um, they're entering the workforce, and it's and as somebody who's a new father, also I do know that childcare is something that is immensely important to trying to you know make your young family or young or your your, your family dynamic or even professional dynamic functional. So having a downtown uh, a, a downtown childcare facility that's also attached to housing would have been the most awesome thing ever I could have ever imagined. And that's something that I think like, you know, hasn't been really brought up, but I think that's something that should be brought up. So anything that would make the already existing workforce that much more effective and that much more, um, I guess, uh, what, dedicated to their needs, I think that's something that we should really look at too. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, excellent point. I mean, we talk a lot about um, kind of the community development aspects of, you know, our day-to-day -day work and, and economic development, certainly childcare. Uh, transportation, housing are all integral components of, of having a vital workforce. And, you know, perhaps more than ever, we've realized the, um, the importance of childcare um, um, and allowing for a, a vital workforce. So um, excellent point. Uh, Donald, a new hand? Uh, no, Sam hand, uh, a different hand. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to jump off at 7.30, but I, I do want to say a couple of negative things. I know you asked for uh, things that you also would not want to see there. Uh, yeah. And because I have to jump off from it, this is basically for you, Dan, but, um, you know, 
I think we've, I think it's mistakenly zoned. I think it's zoned the way it is because that factory was there before we had zoning. Uh, and I honestly think the select board should consider rezoning that area in sort of a long term, um, uh, take a long term look at whether or not it's zoned the way we want it. But I, I do think that uses that would be encouraged or permitted by the current zoning that involved a lot of through traffic, particularly truck traffic or delivery traffic, will be very disruptive in that neighborhood. And we've certainly seen that with the water delivery system, right, select board? So, um, you know, it feels to me like whatever, whatever does happen in there really should not be based on a lot of trucks coming and going, uh, or even a lot of big buses coming and going um, because, of, because of the way uh, that neighborhood feels. So those are a little bit on the negative side, but I, I do think those would be important design characteristics. And um, I, I can stand for a couple more minutes, but I'm gonna hop off in just a couple seconds. Thank you for holding this meeting. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Any other, other thoughts, comments? You know, I, I did want to know, I just did want to pull on a, a thread just a little bit that, that Dan introduced, and certainly we want to make sure it's on the table this evening. Um, you know, as part of this reuse plan, um, there's a parallel track going on here where uh, very soon the uh, folks who own the Energizer facility will be aggressively marketing it through the aforementioned kind of marketing team of uh, uh, VT Commercial and JLL. Um, you know, that, that is a private group that will be soliciting a sale to what is most likely a, a private individual group slash developer. So our reuse plan, um, we hope helps to inform some potential um, reuses there, some potential um, redevelopment there that is beneficial to the community that takes, in to, uh, takes into account the community kind of mindset and desires. Um, but at the end of the day, um, where this plan uh, will not be a decider. Um, we hope it's an influencer. Um, at the end of the day, this is likely to be a private development and um, the people who are going to invest the money will have to make hard decisions about um, how they can get that money back and perhaps a, a little bit more of it. So just wanna get that on the table just to kind of set realistic expectations about what these types of plans can do. Uh, as I noted at the very start of the meeting with regard to the Bennington downtown area wide plan, um, it was really successful in helping to guide the potential redevelopment of a mixed use project in downtown Bennington that I think um, by and large community embraces and feels is, is a really beneficial new addition to our community. So I just wanted to put that out there for folks um, to kind of understand and, and set expectations. Are there any other thoughts, comments, questions? If not, um, I do want to thank people for taking an hour and a half out of one of our, um, out of the evening of one of our few really nice evenings of late um, to join us um, tonight. We will be incorporating um, the feedback that was provided tonight into the document as part of the public process. Um, it does help always guide this process. Um, we balance that against uh, information that's gathered through surveys and through the data, uh, as well as the background research um, that's being done. So. Over the next few weeks, all that's going to be pulled together. Um, we'll present a draft to the steering committee for uh, feedback and input. Uh, and again, within the next couple of months, uh, you will see a draft uh, out on the street for um, the potential reuses of this uh, facility. Um, we're excited to be a part of the process, um, and we certainly appreciate everybody's participation tonight. So thank you very much for joining us.